I'm very honored to be selected as both the C. Henry Smith and Benjamin E.B. lecturer. Thank you to everyone who is tuning in to listen. I'm glad you're here. The Me Too movement has turned a spotlight on sexual violence, and many people are asking, how do we address this reality in our communities? What can we do to stop the violence? In this lecture, I'm going to be focusing on this question in the context of the Mennonite community in Canada and the United States. Mennonites are historically a peace church, with early Anabaptists rejecting participation in military conflict. Mennonites have had 500 years to develop, and in some cases reject, theologies about military violence and work out what it means to be the quiet in the land, pacifists, conscientious objectors, nonviolent resistors. Those different descriptors are snapshots into the development of Mennonite theology around militarism. In contrast to the discussions of the violence of war, Mennonite discussions about sexual violence have happened over a much shorter time frame, even though this violence has always existed. I am old enough to remember a time when sexual violence was never spoken about in church. In the late 1970s, we started to see some discussion begin, so there has been around 50 years of public discourse on it. My question for this research basically is, what trajectory has this discussion taken in the Mennonite Church? What themes do we see in this theology? My source material was Mennonite periodicals from the past 50 years, basically church magazines and newspapers that have been published bi-weekly or monthly. I could have done a 50-year study of Mennonite academic writing about sexual violence, and I hope to do that eventually, but I actually think that the popular press is more revealing. Periodicals are helpful barometers to measure theological opinions. They show new ideas that are emerging and the pushback to those ideas because there are letters to, to the editor arguing or affirming what is printed. And I actually think periodicals probably shape the church more than academic writing because they are more widely read. They are in people's homes. In addition to all those good reasons to do research on periodicals, Due to the wizardry of modern technology, these periodicals are all digitized and you can now do word searches, which means research is much more accurate. I used the search terms rape and abuse to see what came up. I looked at every article where those words were used in the past 50 years. I want to show you the quantitative result of my research, a graph of how often these terms were used. I'll start with the publication, The Mennonite, and the word abuse. The search function of the database told me if the word abuse was on a page of the periodical. If you look at the green line in the year 1970, 15 pages of The Mennonite that year had the word abuse on it. This chart is not about how many times the word was used. You might have an article about abuse and they might use the word abuse 20 times, but that doesn't show up in these stats. It's just how many pages have the word abuse on them. The Mennonite published eight or 900 pages of content a year. So in 1970, 15 of those pages had the word abuse on it in some way. You see from the graph that interest in the topic of abuse has fluctuated over time with a peak of interest in the early 1990s, which declined very rapidly, followed by a gradual upswing of interest in the last number of years. But engagement with the topic of abuse is still down from the 90s. I also used the search term rape to see how often that was mentioned in the Mennonite. You can see the results in the green dotted line. Obviously, much less discussion about this topic. Now I'm adding my research from the Canadian publications, the Mennonite Reporter and the subsequent Canadian Mennonite. The solid blue line is the word abuse. 
you'll again see a peak of interest in the early 90s, although not as much as the American publications. Coverage in the last de decade is slightly exceeding the coverage in the 90s, and the dotted blue line shows that rape is also rarely discussed in this publication. Now I'm adding statistics from the Gospel Herald. The solid red line shows even more of an interest in abuse in the early 90s. They were willing to discuss rape more than any of the other publications, although it's still not a big topic. The Gospel Herald ceased publication in the late 90s, which is why that line stops. I find the trajectory of the discussion about sexual violence fascinating, and perhaps you might find it surprising. If you are a young person, you may think that the church does not talk about sexual violence enough, and maybe you think that the Me Too movement is finally jump-starting the church to think about it. But we have been talking about this as a church for 50 years. That public discourse peaked in the 1990s and mostly never recovered since then, except in Canada. Why did we start talking about it in the 1970s? There are lots of reasons for that, prim primarily the second wave of feminism in society. And why did it drop off? We didn't fix the problem. In fact, sexual violence is the one crime that has not decreased since the 1970s and 80s. Perhaps people got tired of hearing about it, or perhaps the discussion was edged out of public discourse because the changes it called for were too sweeping. In any case, the hashtag MeToo movement has brought this back into the public eye and into the pages of our Mennonite periodicals. Just as a comparison, I counted how many pages per year the Mennonite and the Gospel Herald talked about the concept war. Have a look at this. The dark line at the top with the red outline, that's the Gospel Herald, and the dark line just below it is the Mennonite. In the 70s, war was talked about about 10 times more often than abuse or rape. And even the years when we were talking about abuse the most in the early 90s, we talked about war twice as much. We're talking about war less now in the last decade, so the disparity is not as great. This graph gets me thinking. World Health Organization statistics say that one in three women experience sexual violence in her lifetime. Some groups of people experience even higher rates of sexual violence than that. The readers of these periodicals were directly experiencing sexual violence, but I don't see this concern reflected in how often it's discussed in periodicals. Sometimes it's easier to talk about war over there in that country and harder to talk about the violence in our own homes, to talk about the violence that you are doing to me or I am doing to you. I wonder, if you're attending a Mennonite church or a school or a college, university, how does this graph correspond to your own experience in these institutions? Is sexual violence talked about in the settings you are in? In church through sermons, prayers, or educational material? Or in your schools by administration or through your course material? So having looked at the quantitative part of the research, what did the church press have to say about sexual violence over this 50-year period? I want to share three things I found in my research and three things I didn't find. First, over and over I saw the importance of storytelling. You can't work on something if it's not talked about. Initially, the articles in the periodicals were written by social workers, group home workers, psychologists. They were writing about the people they were helping. And these articles were brief and somewhat vague references to abuse. Church papers may have been reluctant to have people speak frankly, but at a certain point, that changes. In the late 80s, first-person stories of abuse started appearing in the pages of the periodicals. Like one woman who described the effect of growing up as a victim of sexual abuse, 
Quote, it is much like being run over by a huge truck and having to spend the rest of one's life learning to walk again. Only this truck was driven by my father. She goes on to say, but no one, absolutely no one was willing to walk with me. First person stories appeared from victims of sexual assault and abuse. They were mostly written by women and a few were written by men. The authors talked about who hurt them and the effects of the hurt, the self-blame, the anger, the shame, the difficulty engaging in normal activities of life, such as loving yourself or loving other people or loving God. And they talked about how the church responded, which usually was to deny or minimize the hurt. The church, a place that should be a refuge and place of healing, often re-victimized survivors, which greatly added to their trauma. Kathleen Hawkman, in a cover story in 1991 in the Gospel Herald, declared that sexual violence was happening in Mennonite schools and colleges. They are not safe places. There were also stories about trying to support people who have sexually offended and programs that were working to help them not reoffend. The most controversial reporting that appeared in the periodicals were stories about sexual misconduct of church leaders. There was a flurry of these stories in the 1990s. There were always numerous letters to the editor whenever a story like this appeared, saying that it was terrible to make this public, it should be dealt with privately, that it's slanderous to publish them. Even going so far as to claim that the accusations were likely exaggerated and that the investigation was not fair. But there were just as many letters praising the editors for running the stories, saying that the truth must come out. Victims have a right to share the harm that was done to them by a church leader. Editors of Mennonite newspapers joined together to write guidelines explaining that pastoral misconduct is not just a story between two people. It's a violation of public trust in the church and silence only leads to more victims. In the mid nineties, the editor of the Gospel Herald wrote an editorial where he said that in his decades of working in the church press, no other issue had generated more letters to the editor than pre professional sexual misconduct. So that's my first point. Storytelling is important. Name what is actually happening about sexual violence. The second thing I found, writers used social analysis to look at power and they named patriarchy as a problem. In an article in 1990, Ruth Kroll, then director of peace studies at Goshen College, calls the church to stop covering up sexual violence. Quote, a piece of silence is an unjust piece. She goes on to ask, what in our community of faith has allowed sexual violence to go unchallenged? She and many other writers in the 1990s talked about patriarchy. Numerous articles pointed out that the vast majority of sexual violence is committed by men and most of the victims are women and children. Male dominance in the economy, in politics, in the legal system, in schools, in churches, it's connected to sexual violence. These structures protect the abuser and silence or blame the victim. In 1993, several of the, of the periodicals reported about Carolyn Holderett Hagen's C. Henry Smith lecture, where she says, we cannot continue to teach a hierarchical model of men and women. We've got to be braver and bolder about labeling that heresy. Most of the articles were written by women, but some were written by men. There were a number of feature articles where men talked about toxic masculinity, challenging the negative stereotypes they were raised with, 
and looking for a new, healthier masculinity. There was a lot of backlash to the discussion of patriarchy in the letters to the editor section. People defending male headship and female submission as biblical, denouncing feminism as secular and ungodly. This was all happening in the 90s. Now, in the last decade, I counted, and there are just as many first-person stories by survivors as there had been in the 90s. But there is less discussion about patriarchy. Since 2010, there has been a lot of discussion about abuse policies and safe place spaces. But those policies don't say anything about gender. They are neutral, and they have to be because men and women can both be abusers, and so the policy must be neutral. But if you want social change, our public discourse can't just talk about abuse generically. You have to talk about who is doing the abusing and who is getting abused. We see this with racism. You can talk about racism. Racism is bad. We don't want to be racist. Stamp out racism. You might not threaten anyone saying that. But as soon as you talk about the power dynamics of racism in society today, who are the people who are being hurt? Who are the people benefiting? You can see that we are living in a society where white people, like me, have the most power to disadvantage black people, indigenous people, and people of color. Social analysis is essential in order to address inequality. From my research, the social analysis that was done in the 90s was more frequent than what we're seeing in church periodical pages lately. It's still there now, but there aren't as many articles about it. I wonder, what happens to the movement for social change if we are reluctant to talk about power? So that's my second point. My third point is theological reflection. I saw the periodicals discussing a wide range of theological topics. How does the reality of sexual violence shape our understanding of God? Where is God in these stories of sexual violence? And what does this mean for the church? In the 90s, there were numerous articles that delved into this. Biblical scholar Wilma Bailey looked at the biblical character of Bathsheba and how she has been used to show that women are at fault for seducing men. Bailey writes, quote, Rape is an ugly fact of life that too many women must face. Women have been afraid to tell their story for fear of being called a harlot, a slut, a seductress, or an idiot. She goes on to say that the church should take active steps to prevent the violation of women. This might take place in its preaching, in its teaching, in its nurturing of its young, and in the structuring of its institutions. Around the same time, a cover story by Martha Smith Good juxtaposes a modern story of rape with the rape of the biblical character Tamar. She calls for justice, writing, quote, the silence around rape, incest, and other acts of sexual violence against women must be broken. Their pain must be shared. Healing must happen. The time is the 1990s. Other writers looked at ways Matthew 18 has been misused. Survivors are too often expected to meet privately with people who hurt them instead of going to the police. This is dangerous for victims of abuse and puts others in danger as well. In the pages of the periodicals over this 50-year period, we see authors tackling the topic of suffering, forgiveness, humility, sexuality, the role of the church community, and worship in the healing process, among others. The last decade has seen stories about abuse in the church press, but I don't think that we've seen as lively an interaction with biblical texts as we did 30 years ago. So the three things I found in my research was the significance of stories about violence, 
the importance of social analysis about violence, and theological reflection on a wide variety of topics. In research, you are analyzing what you are reading, but you are also looking in the margins. What is not there? What is not spoken of? I want to briefly mention three important things that I did not find in my research. These are areas I think we need to explore as a Mennonite community going forward. First, I only ever came across one article that gave practical advice about physical attacks, advocating self-defense training for women. We have not begun to talk about the ethics of fighting back against sexual violence. I didn't see any discussion about strategies of how to survive sexual assault, or importantly, how to resist sexual coercion and manipulation. I think there's still squeamishness about talking about sexual things. I've been a pastor for a long time and I've heard stories of people being raped in our church communities. We need these strategies. Violence continues to happen. Also, with the exception of a few articles in the 1990s, there has been almost nothing that addresses the people who are doing the violence. Nothing about how to challenge societal training that normalizes violent behavior for men. So, we need some practical help about reducing violence, and I would like to see that in our periodicals. Second, there was almost no discussion about how sexual violence interacts with other oppressions. The people most likely to be hurt are not just women, but also people with disabilities, LGBTQ plus people, Indigenous and Black women, those who are newcomers or economically disadvantaged. When these people are hurt, they are the ones least likely to be able to access good medical care or be treated well by the police and the justice system. The third wave of feminism has brought attention to these webs of oppression, telling us to look at anti-Semitism, look at racism. How are these all connected with sexual violence? The third thing I didn't see. I searched the term abuse, and I looked at every hard article that had that word in it, and I did not find any articles that linked that word with the Mennonite treatment of LGBTQ plus people. Mennonite communities have been abusive in their refusal to acknowledge the spectrum of sexual attraction and gender, and this has resulted in countless deaths from suicide and all sorts of other suffering. And yet, we aren't talking about that as abuse in these periodicals. The pain these individuals and these families experience as they are rejected and expelled from communities or forced into a strict heterosexual mold is a type of sexual violence that needs to be named. It's about power and how Mennonites have used community and spiritual power in oppressive and abusive ways. So the three things I didn't see, practical strategies to reduce violence, discussion of webs of oppression, and naming Mennonite abuse of LGBTQ plus people. I've been talking about difficult things in this lecture. Thanks for sticking with me. I want to end by saying why I'm hopeful, because I am hopeful. You saw in the graph how there was a spike of interest in sexual violence in the 90s. In the 90s, women in parachurch organizations like Mennonite Central Committee were at the forefront of publishing resources and sponsoring dozens of events all over Canada and the United States where people got together to talk about sexual violence and to strategize about change. This parachurch work partly explains that uptick in coverage. The press was reporting on events. And you saw on the graph how that interest in the press dropped off dramatically in the mid-90s. 
Even though church periodicals stopped talking about abuse, the work didn't stop. People were working to help victims, surrounding those who had offended with support, writing policies, revising policies, implementing policies, preaching and teaching, publishing, writing doctoral theses. Just because it didn't make it into the press doesn't mean the movement for change stopped. Now, in the last decade, there is renewed interest in this topic from the press. Curiously, we aren't seeing so many events and conferences, even so many publications, as we did in the 1990s. But what we are seeing is online advocacy. You see, patriarchy works when victims are isolated and silenced. But the internet has slashed through that silence. Survivors can now connect online with other survivors and networks of support. Mennonite communities can be very insular, but because of technology, now people can hear other stories of abuse. They can find support. People that run websites like Into Account, Our Stories Untold, or The Map List are doing important theological reflection, and we see their voices in our church press. Their work is outside church structures, but they are addressing church communities, and I think that that is a very good way to do advocacy. If you are a victim of abuse or sexual violence, there is help for healing. Your experiences are important, and I hope you can find a place to share your story if you want to share it. Similarly, if you have committed sexual violence, there is a way forward too. Mennonites have been at the forefront in creating models that support people who have offended through circles of support and accountability. All this gives me so much hope for the work of social change. Finally, a little plug. I could never have gotten the insights I did without the church press. Church periodicals are important to the health of the church. They are a mirror that allows us to know ourselves and our history. I urge you to financially support religious reporting and publications to make sure they survive. After all, we need places to share the Mennonite peace theology about sexual violence that we will be writing for the next 500 years. Thank you for listening.